early formal academics. Early formal academics. So this idea that we're, we have to push the academic training at an early age is actually causing a lot of damage, a lot of confusion in the minds of children, a lot of uh, disorganization, and um, it's, it's messing with kids' learning abilities and causing a lot of problems later on. Let's unpack some of this. So they did a study recently called, Is Kindergarten the New First Grade? And they found that we're expecting so much of kindergartners now that um, it's almost like it's the first grade. And they compared classrooms in 1998 and 99 with classrooms in 2010 and 11. And they wanted to see what had changed in the last 10 years in teachers' perceptions and in what they were teaching the kids. So, 98 and 99, they found that 29% of kindergarten teachers said that children should learn to read in kindergarten. They asked the same question 10 years later, now 78% felt like kids should learn to read in kindergarten. 53% of kindergartners in 1998-99 were in full-day kindergarten programs. In 2010 and 11, 81% were in full-day programs. Um, this is U.S. Would you, is it about the same here? I, I'm getting for most people this is about the same here. All of them, you said? <laughs> but, oh, not uncommon. Okay, all right, great. So, yeah, very similar, uh, these statistics. Time for art and music has dwindled with sand and water tables or science areas with objects to manipulate. It's not the fun, play-based learning activity type of environment that it used to be. Uh, they're really um, uh, upping the academics. In 98 99, 48% of kindergarten teachers considered reading fluently too much to expect of kindergartners. I'd have to agree with them on this one, right? Well, 10 years later, only 10% felt that way. 90% of kindergartners are being taught to read. 97% are in classes in which composing and writing complete sentences is a needed skill. And 99% are learning capitalization and punctuation. This is the kindergarten of today. And it's, it makes you kind of shake your head like, wow, I mean, why are they asking so much of children? And it just goes back to what our priorities are, what our focus is. We think this is the key to success in life, and so we push it earlier and earlier. The research is showing, though, that it's not doing us as much good as we want it to, and it's causing some problems. 84% um, of kindergarten teachers feel that attending preschool is very important for success in kindergarten because they're expecting so much of kindergartners. Now you have to go to preschool to do well in kindergarten. And they consider it very important or essential that children already know how to use pencils and paintbrushes, know most of the letters of the alphabet, and be able to count to 20 before they ever get to kindergarten. So, a lot of people are very excited about this. Early learning, head start, whatever you want to call it, they're saying this is the greatest advancement in mankind. We're, we're, we're pushing our kids in the right direction. Yippee, this is all exciting, right? Mm. There's a significant body of scientific research with top input, top input um, from some of the best psychologists, some of the best developmentalists, some of the best neurosurgeons and neurophysiologists around the world that are saying, wait a second, put on the brakes. They say, yes, kids may be learning. We're not questioning that they're learning things in the classroom, but they're missing out on aspects of development that used to be integral to childhood, they're not even getting it anymore, and we're causing a disorganized brain in the process. The weight of evidence suggests that an academic setting before the age of eight for girls and 10 for boys is harmful to the mind. We're, you know, obviously they can learn a lot of academic skills before eight or 10, but sit them down in the classroom in the full academic environment before the age of eight or 10 is damaging to the mind based on the research and the evidence. So let's get into a bit of an understanding of how this works. Anyone know what this is? A neuron, yes, a brain cell. It's what your brain is made out of. It's what it uses for all of its functions, including listening to me right now, if you are. You were born with about 100 billion of these, but you don't have that many now, and that's okay. That's a compliment, because the whole process of brain development is one of specialization. Your brain identifies the neurons it needs, and it forms routes through those neurons, and it begins tossing out the extra ones. This is why uh, they say it's easier to learn a language, a second language, at an early age. They say you're born with about all the neurons you need for to learn any language on the earth. You're born that way. 
But then as you learn your native tongue, and maybe a second one, it is good for kids to learn a second language, but as you learn your native tongue, then your brain begins to toss out the extra ones. And that's why at about 13, it becomes a lot more difficult to learn a second language. So that's just the process of specialization. But then as they specialize, they also have to undergo another process known as myelination. Myelin is an electrically insulating compound. It coats the axon of the neuron in sections and it speeds the information transfer. Uh, previous to myelination, a neuron is virtually unusable, and then once it becomes myelinated, the information travels about 100 times faster that of an unmyelinated neuron. It's critical for development. It is basically the process of, of um, brain cell development. So trying to force information transfer over this unmyelinated neuron is a futile effort, very inefficient at best. And by the same token, trying to force information transfer over an unmyelinated brain section is going to be a futile effort um, and can actually can lead to problems. So this myelination process occurs in stages and on a fairly set schedule throughout childhood. If we start with birth, all but the areas for the most essential bodily functions are unmyelinated. And then let's look at a few. We're not going to look at all of this schedule development, but we'll look at a couple components of it. From conception to 15 months, we see very basic brain development. The brain starts with the very lower thinking centers. It starts with the, um, the inner, you know, the core muscles. It always moves from inner to outer, lower to higher. Um, so, you know, core muscles moving into the limbs, to the, to the hands, you know, base, very basic brain development. Then at about 15 months into four and a half years, we see the limbic system and relationship development. The limbic system is that emotion generating area of the brain. And this is why it is key that children are with their parents as much as possible at an early age. And this is the time in which they are developing their understanding of emotional security, of relationships, determining who they can count on, who cares for them. Uh, very, very important at an early age. Now, at about four and a half years, we begin to see right hemisphere elaboration. Elaboration, myelination, development, I'll use all those terms uh, synonymously. So at four and a half to seven years, we see the right hemisphere begin. Now, the um, boys have a slower growth period, usually about two years extra in right hemisphere development. I didn't say boys were slow, <laughs> but they develop differently. And that's okay. God has made them that way. They take about two years longer in the right hemisphere. And then at about seven years in girls and about nine years in boys, we begin to see left hemisphere development. The left hemisphere will continue through a much longer span of time, whereas the right hemisphere is very centered in the early years. And then at eight years, we see frontal lobe elaboration. So the brain is developed, uh, is split into two hemispheres, the right hemisphere and left hemisphere. Now it's a myth that you're either right-brained or you're left-brained. You know, you do use both areas of your brain. And it's also not true that, you know, only your right hemisphere can handle a certain task and it's not going to use other areas. Your brain uses a vast array of areas for different types of thinking. But we still find general processing centers for certain types of thinking within certain brain regions. So the right hemisphere deals with things such as images, rhythm, emotion, intuition, imagination, creativity, feeling, faith, belief, large motor control. This is what's been termed the artistic side of your brain. The left hemisphere deals with a lot more of the logic, um, so detail, parts and processes of language, linear patterns, logic, critical thinking, numbers, reasoning skills. Take your guess between these two hemispheres, which one is most important, not that you're not going to use both, but which one is very critical for sit-down academics as we know it? The left, absolutely, it's the left hemisphere. You're, you're getting the parts and processes of language, the numbers, the reasoning, all that stuff, very important for the classroom, for academic learning. Also, the primary motor cortex, which is located within the frontal lobe, deals with fine motor development, inner speech, that's the ability to internalize concepts, and then fine motor eye teaming is using both eyes to focus on a subject, and foveal focus, two-dimensional focus. You use all of these things in the classroom, Back to the schedule of development, we see the right hemisphere from four and a half to seven or even nine or, or 10 or even 12 in boys, and then seven to nine years, seven or nine, this is when it starts. This is not a stage of development. This is when the left hemisphere begins development. Are you seeing a problem? Yeah, absolutely. We have a, a brain region critical for academic learning that hasn't developed 
at your average school start. Whether that school start is three or six, either one is before it begins development. The right hemisphere organizes and myelinates from about four and a half to seven to 10 in girls through 10 or 12 in boys. The left hemisphere begins between the ages of seven and nine, and the neurons in the frontal lobe begin at about eight years of age. So a typical school starting age here in Australia, it's about four or five, right? Yeah, same for, same for the US, although some states in the US are starting preschool at 18 months now. It's insane. So what happens when we give kids academics before brain reasons are ready? Can we accelerate learning? Can we speed this process up somehow? We'd like to think we could, but it's not working out so well. Attempts at academics during this stage can actually be damaging to the mind. So let's assess some of this damage. First of all, we need to understand what is known as neuroplasticity. We are born with this incredible ability to adapt to our environment. And the brain just figures things out and it just, it molds itself around its environment. It's incredibly powerful. It's a responsibility, really, for parents to give that ideal environment and hope, I suppose, that you can change the environment and, and fix some things that have happened in the past. But neuroplasticity also allows the brain to step in and fill in for regions that are yet undeveloped or, um, un, uh, or, or non-existent. Like I was talking with a neurosurgeon recently and we were talking about this concept and he told me, look, he said, I could do surgery on your brain. And uh, he said, as long as I didn't take out the wrong part, hopefully not, and as long as I didn't take out too much, he said, another area of your brain would then step in and fill in for the part I took out. He said, but the problem is, it will never be as efficient as the correct region. Your brain will always be slightly handicapped by me doing this. So you can function, you can do okay, but there will always be some, some uh, problems with that. So if we apply that same principle of the brain filling in, and we take this little boy here, he's in math class, is that left hemisphere is being asked to do a task for which it is not ready. What's the brain going to do? It's going to find a region that is ready. And the process of brain development, as I've already stated, goes from lower to higher. The brain starts with the lower thinking centers, moves into the higher thinking centers. This is why the frontal lobe is one of the last regions to fully develop. And that's exactly what happens. If a task is asked of the brain for which the corresponding region is not matured, it will form neural routes through lower, more developed sections resulting in almost permanent organizational damage. For, trying to force a child to learn a concept for which they are not ready can actually do damage to the unmyelinated brain. So the brain finds that region that is ready and it starts forming neural routes through there and it forms a habit and that's the concerning part. Is this clear so far? Am I making sense? I know this is a lot of science. Okay, great. These are my words. This is my explanation. Let's hear this now from a scientist. Again, Dr. Jane Healy. Uh, she just puts things so well. I love quoting from her. Before brain regions are myelinated, they do not operate efficiently. We've seen that clearly. That, that's, um, that's a given at this point. For this reason, trying to make children master academic skills for which they do not have the requisite maturations may result in mixed up patterns of learning. Because if the right brain system isn't yet available or working smoothly, forcing may create a functional organization in which less adaptive, lower systems are trained to do the work. That's exactly what we've just seen, but she's put it in a nutshell for us, explaining how we have these other brain regions filling in, training a lower system to do the work. Now she called it functional organization. I prefer functional disorganization. <laughs> it's not the organization God designed from the beginning. And the thing to remember is this is semi-permanent. This isn't something that just goes and fixes itself later on because, again, if we start at four with this, by the time they reach that age of eight when the, other, the, the correct brain region has kicked in, they've formed a habit. Four years of continual routing through a lower thinking center and the brain isn't just going to automatically say, oh, cool, and change itself. No, it's adapting to the environment it's given in early childhood and uh, we are forming habits and we are killing later thinking abilities. And that's the real concerning part. Trying to drill higher level learning into immature brains may force them to perform with lower level systems and thus impair the skill in question. We are damaging later skills because we're routing it through the lower thinking centers and not allowing it to develop into the higher thinking centers. Any learning that has to be pushed into a child may end up doing more harm than good. Plunged daily into the fire of inappropriate expectation, children's early promise shrivels and non-learning becomes a habit. 
They may be labeled, treated, exhorted, and eventually tutored, but the basic issue remains unchanged. The school and the child are on different schedules. And that's the problem. We have too many schools and children on different schedules. And it's really important to remember that this isn't something that fixes itself later on. We need to really pay attention to what's happening in early childhood and not create problems that are developing later on. And again, they might seem to be doing okay. It's kind of like the girl I told the story about right at the start here, who got the answer down on paper. They, these, a lot of these children can perform okay in school and they get the answers. They, they learn how to memorize things and to get by pretty well and okay but we're stunting the thinking abilities because we're routing it through the lower thinking centers. And so they won't develop into more conceptual types of learning. They'll be stuck with the basic, um, uh, basic thinking abilities. It's like the crooked tree. This is a parable of the crooked tree. Anyone seen any crooked trees? <laughs> right out here, right? <laughs> Plenty of crooked trees. Do you go up to a crooked tree and try to straighten it out? No, that's impossible. When can you straighten a tree? When it's young, when it's very young. And that's what's, what's happening in early childhood. We're bending that tree. And if we want straight trees of the mind, we need to let them grow how God designed them to and not try to force something on them that they're not ready for, creating a crooked tree. Okay, there's another area, though, aside from just brain development, and that is the area of vision development that is incredibly impacted by the early classroom environment. The capability for eye teaming is that ability to use both eyes to focus on a subject, and then foveal focus is two-dimensional focus. Those functions don't fully develop until approximately age nine. Part of the reason for this is that uh, the control for these functions is uh, located within that primary motor cortex, partially. There are other areas, but partially there, and so that's not developing until about age eight. Less than 5% of vision actually occurs in your eyes. Now <laughs> you're like, wait a second, what do I have eyes for, right? It's, they're a lens for your brain. Your brain does most of the processing. And because of this, for full vision to occur, information from all the cerebral lobes must be accessed. So as Dr. Raymond Moore puts it well, even though a single clear visual image may be received by the eye, the, the, the child can see. It's not a matter of them being blind and not seeing an object. No, they can see the object, but a child might still not be able to decode the printed material because of deficiencies in organization and interpretation in the central nervous system due to lack of maturation. So the, the central nervous system hasn't fully matured yet, and therefore full vision isn't able to occur because they're not, they can't access all the brain regions yet. Also, let's look at just the physical standpoint of the eye. Before age seven, the ciliary bodies that control the shape of the lens are short and allow maximum three-dimensional peripheral and distance vision. Where do you get type, this type of vision? Classroom or outside? Outside, outside right? Three-dimensional peripheral distance. Yeah, you're not going to get a whole lot of that in the classroom. Maybe some, but not a lot. And then after age seven, those ciliary bodies lengthen, and that allows for more foveal or two-dimensional vision. Now, as I'm talking about foveal or two-dimensional vision, you realize that reading is two-dimensional. Yet reading is not a three-dimensional process. So you need good foveal vision for good reading abilities. Now, as a result, um, oh, also I should mention that the eyeball itself doesn't become fully shaped with collagen fibers until approximately age nine. So as a result, Periods of reading, longer periods of reading, say more than about 15 or 20 minutes at a time without relaxing the distance, the, the focus into the distance um, can cause inflammation of the eyeball and that can lead to myopia or nearsightedness. Now the rate of nearsightedness in the US has increased 66% since the 1970s. That's a major concern, but it's not just in the US. The rates of myopia, difficulty seeing distant objects are soaring. The trend is matched in many other countries, causing eye doctors to wonder what could be causing the decline in human vision. They're like, what is going on here? It's become an epidemic. The US is currently 50% myopic, and that's, that's a concern. I mean, that's a pretty high rate of myopia, but they're nowhere near East Asia, which is at 90% myopic. Seoul, Korea is 96% myopic. Now scientists have long been wondering what is causing this rapid increase? And for years, the standard, and still is, if you go to your eye doctor today, most of them, the standard answer is it's genetic. There's nothing you can do about it, they say. It's somewhere back in your history, and so you're gonna have bad eyes. That's just how it works. There's nothing you can do. Well, they did a study in Alaska. That's a northern state in the US. Um, and they had a large population of Inuit or Eskimo 
uh, families. And they did this study right after Alaska became a state and started requiring schooling for its children. So they had a unique situation of parents and grandparents who had not been to school at the customary age of five or six, and then children and young people who had gone to school at your customary age of five or six. And so they looked at the rates of myopia in the children and the young people. They were 60% myopic, pretty high. And so they expected to see very similar uh, results in the parents and grandparents, right? It's genetic. It should, we should be finding pretty close to 60% in the parents and grandparents. It was less than 1%. They almost couldn't find it. And they said, hang on a second, this can't be genetic. I mean, genetics don't change that fast, right? You know, parent to child. Um, so they're trying to figure out, well, okay, what is causing this? And so they look around the world and they find that the rates of myopia are consistently higher in the more schooled regions than in the unschooled or more indigenous regions. East Asian countries, famous for their high level of pressure in academics, more time in the classroom, more to, they spend twice the amount of homework time than the average US child. Um, incredible pressure in the academics, they spend so much time inside, they have the highest rate of myopia in the world. Take Africa, a country that's predominantly indigenous, or at least spending a lot of time outside, they're at 10 to 20% myopic. Uh, Australia, sorry I don't have it on the slide, I did check Australia, it's about 30% myopic right now. Um, so you must be doing something right, you're not the highest in the world, that's for sure. They looked at Natal, Brazil, within the city they were 13.3% myopic. That's pretty low, showing that um, genetics must have some play in this. But they looked at the indigenous tribes of northwestern Brazil around the city of Natal, 2.7%. <laughs> so again, there's a direct correlation here. Something with the amount of time they're spending inside, they weren't sure exactly what it is, and they are finding that indeed it is not just time spent studying, uh, but it's time spent outside. Children who spend less time outside, according to the Journal of Nature, were at greater risk of developing myopia. In Taiwan, teachers were asked to send their children outside for an 80-minute period each day, while a school right down the road did not send their kids outside. At the end of the one-year study, those, um, the school who had sent their children outside were 8% myopic, while the ones who had not sent their kids outside, 18% myopic. Same environment, same ethnic group, same genetics, basically. So again, a direct correlation between how much time they're spending outside. Now, part of the reason for this benefit is the time spent looking at objects more distant than text on a page. We know that close-up work definitely can damage the eyes, but there's more to it than that. Scientists have actually found that the bright light that you experience outside can impact the development of the eye, and it's actually beneficial to the eyes. To understand this, let's look at what myopia is. So, a normal eye is very rounded in shape, with a focal point right at the back of the eyeball then a myopic eye becomes inflamed, it becomes elongated, and it changes the focal point from the back of the eyeball to farther up, and that makes the more distant objects blurry. So that's a basic principle of myopia. The eyeball becomes inflamed, it elongates. And they have found that light stimulates the release of dopamine in the retina. Now get that, we, <laughs> dopamine, isn't that a neurotransmitter? It is, now they're finding in the eye, very interesting. This neurotransmitter blocks the elongation of the eye during development. Did you catch that? Light blocking the elongation of the eye. That's equivalent to light is blocking the development of myopia. Retinal dopamine is normally produced on a diurnal cycle, meaning that it ramps up during the day, tells the eye to switch from rod-based nighttime vision to cone-based daytime vision. Researchers now suspect that under dim, typically indoor lighting, the cycle is disrupted with consequences for eye growth. Based on epidemiological studies, Ian Morgan, who's a myopia researcher at the Australian National University, estimates that children need to spend around three hours per day under light levels of at least 10,000 lux to be protected against myopia. All right, a couple numbers we should unpack here. First of all, how many hours per day? Three. That's far more than your average child is getting. Um, you know, they spend a lot of time in school, and then they spend a lot of time in front of the media, and it's they're most children are not getting three hours outside a day. And this is at least three hours a day that they're needing. But then this 10,000 lux, what in the world is 10,000 lux? Well, go out on a bright sunny day and stand in the shade and you have about 10,000 lux. So it's not full sunlight, but it is full daylight. 
The way I understand it is that lux is a measurement of the volume of light. So if you could somehow scoop it up, put it in a box, that's the measurement of lux. So it's not the brightness of light, but it's the uh, measurement of a volume of it. So take these windows here, go outside the window on a, on a bright day, and you might be getting 10,000 lux. Come inside to this room, and that you still have the same volume of light, but it becomes dissipated into the room, and therefore the lux measurement will begin to go down. So if daylight is 10,000 lux, any guesses as to what the average well-lit classroom is? A well-lit classroom, how many lux do you think? 4,000. Uh, 3,000. Anyone else? 1,500. <laughs> Terrible. Not even close to the 10,000 lux necessary. Now, I did hear when I was in New Zealand, they were saying that they're requiring now that offices be um, designed with at least 700 lux. And I thought, that's great, but that's not 10,000. <laughs> you know, we need far more than what we're getting inside. Kids have got to go outside for proper development of the eye. I was talking with a family recently, talking with a mother. They had a, a teenage daughter, and she was telling me about when her daughter was about 12 or 13, I think it was, and she had severe myopia, really bad myopia. She was going for yearly checkups to the eye doctor, and uh, she came there one year, and the eye doctor looked at her eyes and said, you know, I'm really sorry, at the rate your myopia is progressing, you're going to be legally blind within one year. Can you imagine hearing that as a teenager? She was pretty devastated, and so the mother asked the eye doctor and said, well, well what's causing the myopia? Isn't there something we can do about it? And what do you think he says? Oh, it's genetic. There's nothing you can do. He said, you, the mom, have bad eyes, so your daughter's going to have bad eyes. That's just the way it is. Thankfully, she refused to believe this. She did some research. She came across this study about, uh, from Dr. Morgan, how he stated that kids need to spend three hours outside every day. Her daughter was a teenager. The damage has already been done, but she figured, hey, it's worth a try. Let's see if it helps any. And as she thought about it more, she realized, you know, my daughter always likes to sit inside and read. She rarely goes outside. She's always inside, always reading a lot. She, she was the bookworm of the family. So I said, great, we're going to make a change to the family schedule. Three hours outside every day is the new law of the family. <laughs> so three hours outside every day. Six months later, they're back at the eye doctor. He checks her eyes out and says, wow, I'm not sure what's going on here, but your myopia is the same as it was six months ago. And I don't even think they told the eye doctor yet what they were doing. Uh, so they kept up the program six months later. So a year has now gone by. At the time, she should be legally blind. Checks her eyes out, and he says, I don't really understand this. Um, this isn't supposed to happen, but your myopia has actually regressed. Now, that's not supposed to be possible. Myopia is not supposed to be curable. It had actually gone and was better than it was a year earlier, simply spending time outside. I mean, how much easier can it get, right? Just a little change to your schedule and get some time outside. This isn't something hard and complicated to do. Children need to experience the world. The eyes need to ex actively experience the world as a whole, not sitting there with a textbook, no, as a whole, for vision to develop fully. So formal schooling before 8 or 10, you know, that age 9 about when the eyes are fully developed, um, places demands on the eyes that are unreasonable and damaging. Okay, I'm going to move quickly through some other points here. Again, all of this is on the DVD series, so if you're missing any of this, you can watch it there. Movement is critical for proper development. We've already addressed how important that is, so I just want to touch on this again. The cerebellum, um, very critical for learning. Physical activity greatly aids the development of the cerebellum. It's been found to enhance the growth and greater connection between the neurons. They found that a child, in order for them to sit still, to pay attention, and visually remember the shapes of letters and numbers, the child first needs to have developed her, his or her proprioceptive system. That's a sense of the body in space. Sitting still, paying attention, visually remembering letters and numbers, that's school, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. And so they're actually finding that children need to develop a sense of their body in space in order for them to do that. They've done famous experiments with kittens. I, I won't get into the whole experiment, but they found that kittens, in order to develop a certain type of vision, had to actually interact with their world. If they just sat there sedentary, they would never develop a certain type of vision. So um, that's, that's the understanding 
a sense of the body in space is critical for them to do well in school. They need that whole body movement. There's also something known as the brain-derived neurotropic factor. This is uh, shortened to BDNF. And when we exercise, our working muscles send a uh, protein into our bloodstream known as IGF-1. And this protein then stimulates the release of BDNF, the brain-derived neurotropic factor. This protein helps new neurons and their connections grow. It's like uh, a fertilizer on your brain, you know, just helping it develop and learn and um, protecting the neurons, very, very important. But more than just helping the brain of an adult, what they find is that when you look at the chemical level of myelination, the actual chemical process that, that allows myelination to proceed, you will find elevated levels of BDNF. Literally that BDNF is required for myelination to proceed. Elevated levels of BDNF during the early stages of myelination increase the speed and extent of the final process. Literally kids have to move for their brains to myelinate. We've seen how important myelination is, right? I mean that's a critical aspect of element. So they literally need to move around for the, their, um, their brains to develop properly. Small children should be left free as what? Lambs, free as lambs. To run out of doors, to be free and happy, should be allowed the most favorable opportunities to lay the foundation for sound constitutions. Also, language development. Language development is often hindered in the classroom because children don't have what is known as inner speech. Inner speech is that, uh, the scientific term used to describe your ability to internalize a concept without having to say it out loud. I'm sure we all notice that kids like to talk to themselves, right? I mean, you watch a little child even playing by themselves, and they'll talk to themselves. That's because they don't have that ability that we as adults have to internalize our thoughts. And so that's not developing until around age eight, um, approximately, sometimes a bit later. So as Dr. Healy puts, good language, like the synapses that make it possible, is gained only from what kind of engagement? Interactive engagement. Children need to talk as well as to hear, and that's the problem with the classroom. They're sitting there being talked to and not with. They're not getting the interactive engagement that they need. Learned helplessness is often created um, Dr. Healy, again, I often wonder how many children decide they are dumb about certain subjects when the truth is that someone simply laid on the learning too soon in a form other than the one they needed to receive it in at the time. We're creating uh, a response in the mind where they believe that they're incapable of learning something. They believe they're just dumb about something when the fact is it's just been pushed on them too early and they just needed a bit of extra time to develop those abilities. But you say, won't my child be delayed? How in the world would they ever catch up? I mean, if I wait till they're eight or 10, they're gonna be four years behind the rest of their classmates. That's a fair question to ask. So let's spend a bit of time on this. Children who start academics after AJ usually end up far ahead of the early starters because when children are given time for their minds to develop, they will experience much less frustration when the academics begin and they'll learn much faster because they are ready to learn it. Dr. Raymond Moore here, in a, school, in, a, sorry, in a study of 300 individuals who started school at about age eight or later, all of them quickly caught up with their classes and in most cases performed well above the class average. There is substantial agreement among school entrance age researchers that children who enter school later are significantly higher in academic achievement than those who enter earlier. Most late starts, usually without formal training before their first school enrollment, quickly catch up academically and often pass their more school experienced peers. And the late starters generally excel in behavior, in sociality, and in leadership. I mean, these are three important areas to consider, right? Not everything is all about how well they're doing in the academics. They need to be learning these things well. How many of you want well-behaved children? Only a couple of you, unfortunately. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Not enough interactive engagement going on here. <laughs> and what they find is that if the brain is ready for it, all of the learning necessary for success in high school can be accomplished in only two or three years of formal skill study. This might seem a bit extreme. Uh, they also find that if the brain is ready for it, it only takes 30 contact hours to learn reading to a college proficient level. It's just not the complicated, process, long drawn out process that we think it is. It's like this. Let me give a simple example, and I'm sorry to the teachers here who are thinking, oh, that's not really how we do it, but hypothetically here. Let, let's just suppose, for sake of illustration, 
if we think about the process of learning math. And so first grade, we start with the basic addition of one. So you have five plus two, you know, something like that. The brain's not quite ready for it though. And so it's a bit of a struggle to understand that. And so we have to repeat it over and over and over and over until they eventually get this understanding. And so, you know, you spend a whole lot of time learning this. Second grade rolls around and now you add the addition of tens. So now you have, you know, 12 and 13. And, you know, basic uh, addition there that we've just added a bit too. But again, they're not quite ready for it, so you're adding a little bit each time, you know, repetition, repetition, repetition. Third grade rolls around and you have the addition of hundreds now. Fourth grade and you have the addition of thousands. Yeah, I know that maybe it's not actually done like this in school, but you, you get the concept here that we're adding a little bit each year. Suppose though we wait until fourth grade. Now, I, I hope you've learned some addition before fourth grade. You know, I hope you can you know, go into the kitchen, think about how much math you can learn in the kitchen, just for example. But just suppose that we wait until fourth grade. Now the brain's ready for it. We sit down and we say, okay, let's learn addition of ones. Got that? Sure. Yeah, no problem. I can understand that. I've seen it in real life, and so now we're just applying it on paper. Okay, now let's add some, some uh, tens to it. Sure, I can understand that. Now hundreds, now thousands. And in an hour, you've taught them what took you four years because you were constantly pushing the brain ahead of itself. That's the concept that I'm trying to explain here. It's not a matter of, I mean, it is a matter of catching up, but it's almost that the brain has built that foundation so they're ready for it. And you don't have to lockstep them through grade by grade. No, you just look at the concept, say, can they understand it? And they catch up within a month or two easily. I've, I've, hundreds of students that I've talked to who have started at 8, 9, 10, even 11 or 12 for the boys a month, two months, and they're right up to par and, and then well ahead of the ones who started earlier. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's strongly supported by a lot of history, a lot of research that you don't have to go through 12 years of school to do well. You know, you, you can start later when the brain is ready and be able to do far less than 12 years of school. A young man I know started at uh, 12, I think, 11 or 12, I think. He finished up at age 17 and went on to an engineering degree in college with a 4.0. And that's just a very, one out of hundreds that I've talked to. Again, God's methods always work. And when we, when we work with his plan of development, um, they, will, they will excel. You know, I was in Africa recently. Uh, I was doing some teacher training at a school in Tanzania. Uh, at a primary school, and um, I presented some of this information to the teachers and the staff there, and I'm used to getting a lot of questions, so I open it up for questions, and uh, a gentleman raises his hand and said, well, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to share my experience on this subject. I said, sure, go ahead. And if I could back up for just a minute, you know, I always believed that you had to be teaching children all these things in early on. Um, even if you weren't sitting them down with a textbook, you taught it in everyday life. So math in the kitchen, in the garden, and science, and, and you know, history through telling them stories, and you know, stuff like that. But they don't really have that uh, experience in third world countries many times. Um, as this gentleman described to me, he said, well, I was a herds boy until I was 13. He said, I finally convinced my parents to let me go to school. I didn't know anything about school. So I went there, and it, I didn't think it was too terribly hard. So he said two months went by and it came time for the national exams. I've seen their national exams. They're quite impressive what they're asking out of the students. They're very advanced. And this wasn't the exam for first grade. No, this was the exam for age 13 that he was at. And his teacher said, no, you've only been in school for two months. You can't take the exam. And he said, it's not been that hard so far. Why don't you let me try? So she said, okay, fine. You can give it a try. He took the test and was top of his school two months in school. I thought, wow, this guy's just a genius or something. And so he, he lowers his hand. Another one raises his hand. Well, I, I just wanted to share my experience, he said. I was a herds boy until I was 12. And uh, I went to school and I was there for six months and it came time for the national exams and my teacher wouldn't let me take them, but I convinced to let him do it anyway. And I scored top of the school. I thought, wow, we have two geniuses. So. <laughs> He lowers his hand, another one raises his hand. Well, I was a herds boy until I was 12, and same story. Another one, same story. There must have been four or five of them that told me this story. And it just really struck me the fact that God's methods work. I mean, spending time outside, they were getting all this physical activity, they were laying the foundation for the later learning abilities. So once they were, in, 
once they were confronted with this experience, they caught on very, very quickly with no problems at all. So I would highly encourage you to teach your child many of these things through everyday life. But evidently, you can go herd cows and still do okay in school <laughs> with, with only a couple months. <clears throat> a couple other points I'll mention. Uh, one is the concept of socialization. You know, I think I've pretty well addressed that in terms of age integration being better for socialization. It's not necessary that kids are with kids their same age for proper socialization. Um, they need to be learning from a wide range of ages. Also consider the concept of maternal separation. Um, how we are separating these young children from their parents at an early age for large portions of the day, we know that is very damaging to the mind. Um, as this graph illustrates, this is how we used to view the concepts of emotion and cognitive areas of the brain. They were just kind of these separate areas with a little bit of overlap. We now realize they are very intertwined together. You can't separate the emotional and cognition functioning centers of the brain. Yes, they might have different regions of the brain, but they're very, very connected in, in the real life and how it plays out. Um, and what they're finding is that a child has to have its emotional needs met first to enable it to do well academically. So a child has to have the emotional security, it has to know that someone cares about them, has to have built that foundation, and that can take a few years to develop, you know, into four or five or six even. Um, they have to lay that foundation and then they can advance into the later learning abilities. A child relates to people into the world primarily through interaction with parents or parent surrogates. Even the best daycare cannot completely neutralize the negative social, emotional, and cognitive effects of mother-child discontinuity. When the child is allowed to develop a strong bond with an adult, especially a parent, a much more emotionally stable and socially competent child will be the result. This is a beautiful picture of how it should be. You know, that connection with the mother at an early age. This is critical. Last point I want to make is that of spirituality. We have to remember this is our ultimate goal in raising children, to, for them to be spiritually strong, to be morally strong. The right hemisphere, my slide's a bit incorrect, it doesn't totally control spirituality, but it heavily influences spiritual and moral development. And the early years are a critical period. It has to have a particular type of experience for this to develop well. The early years are a critical period for the right hemisphere. It will miss out literally miss out if we're not focusing on moral development in the early years. Also, pressure to develop the left hemisphere through academics begins to suppress the development of the right hemisphere. So we are, and, and that's precisely why I've titled this talk, Doing the Right Job at the Wrong Time. We need to be focusing on moral development. I'm not advocating this idea that, oh, you know, you're not putting them in school, so just let them raise themselves. No, 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 no. We're, we're, we've got the wrong focus sometimes, though, and we need to shift this focus and focus on what is important at the early years, give them a bit of time, and once they get to the later years, they'll catch on to these academics uh, much better. <clears throat> and yet, this is not new research. These are not new ideas that I brought forth. In the early education of children, many parents and teachers fail to understand that the greatest attention needs to be given to the physical constitution, that a healthy condition of body and mind may be secured. It has been the custom to encourage children to attend school when they were mere babes needing a mother's care. Parents should be the only teachers of their children until they have reached eight or ten years of age. Does that not line up perfectly with all the science we've just seen? Absolutely. Lines up with the brain science and the development of the eye and everything we just looked at. Look, I mean, this was written how many years ago? 150 years ago, something like that? This is amazing. As fast as their minds can comprehend it, the parents should open before them. Oh, here's a good book. God's great book of nature. And here's a good schoolroom. The only schoolroom for children until eight or 10 years of age should be in the open air amid the opening flowers and nature's beautiful scenery and their most familiar textbook, The Treasures of Nature. These lessons, imprinted upon the minds of young children amid the pleasant, attractive scenes of nature, will not soon be forgotten. This was God's ideal environment. We could go back to this. So what's it going to boil down to? 
It's going to boil down to parents making these decisions within their home to make a difference in the lives of their children. The position of the parent is one of the most responsible on earth, yet it is far too lightly regarded by the majority of the world. The future of the rising generation is in the hands of parents. For in a great measure, they hold within their control the destiny of their children for time and for eternity. The salvation of the young depends almost wholly upon the training they receive in childhood. This is, this is the critical window of time. Let's focus on this. Bow your heads with me. We'll close, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity we've had to look at this important topic. Lord, we've seen how important it is that families are taking up this work, that parents are taking up this work, and I just pray for each family represented here, each parent who is trying to do that best job that you have entrusted them with. Give them strength, Lord. Give them wisdom and understanding to follow your way. We thank you so much for this knowledge, for this information that you have blessed us with. We are truly blessed. We thank you for it, and I pray that we will have wisdom to apply it. And I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've enjoyed watching these programs and would like more information, please contact us through the information on your screen.